Activities. I'm sure yeah. you want to hear about public diplomacy yeah. activities. Yes. Or I mean, if, 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 if I was the foreign minister, for instance, I would talk about not, not the minister of state. The foreign minister, I would talk about football. But that's not that's not what you want to hear about. I guess. Uh, well, public diplomacy. Just very shortly. I mean, if you're a traditional diplomat, then basically you're used to working government to government. That's the whole idea. We travel abroad in order to represent our country in contact with the local authorities in the country we're in. That's traditional, classic diplomacy. But uh, 
and, the, and, and, and of course using those contacts to ministers and other high officials in order to either uh, explain our situation or to uh, kind of promote ideas, policies, values, whatever it may be. That's the traditional uh, work through official channels. I think everybody knows, and since you're all here, uh, you already probably know more about uh, public diplomacy than, than I do. Uh, that just doesn't do the trick anymore. It doesn't. Uh, first of all, uh, we aim at a lot more than just narrow contact. So we need to get out to the widest possible audience. Uh, and uh, to get our information across, our ideas across, you could say we're traveling and in, in, in selling nations or nation branding. And, and that, that doesn't cut it if you just walk up to the Minister of Foreign Affairs with all respect, whether it's in Copenhagen or in Budapest, you need to get the message across to uh, those who are not only the top decision makers, but also those who influence the top decision makers. And the whole way through the chain, it's like, uh, in a way, you could say you need to influence those who, in the ultimate situation as voters, will influence the government that you would like to influence. Uh, it's a long way, sometimes a very long way, sometimes very complex, uh, but that's the way that I think more and more diplomats are working today. The instruments that we're using are anything from you know, being here today. I guess what I'm doing right now, we'll be spending the next two hours uh, doing, not just talking about public diplomacy, but doing public diplomacy. I will probably make a lot of political blunders and mistakes, say things that I shouldn't have done, uh, have said, during these two hours, and, and hopefully some will get angry, well, probably somebody will get angry at me, hopefully somebody will listen to me and think, okay, maybe this guy has a good idea, maybe he has a thought, maybe he has some values that we would like to uh, adopt as well and maybe, uh, you know, spread <coughs> the word in your own country. I mean, that's basically, very simply, what we're doing. We're doing it by going out, talking to normal people. Doesn't right, quite make it if you just walk around in the streets, so you have to target your audience, universities, conferences, uh, big meetings, but also the social media have become extremely important instruments today. They were just five years ago, we had no clue. Uh, Facebook was something for young kids. Uh, really frustrating. Uh, my own daughters were on Facebook all the time. I thought it was a waste of time. Now, my embassy is on Facebook. We have to. That's the way of communicating. Uh, I thought Twitter was really ridiculous until uh, I was told just a few weeks ago that, Tom, now you're on Twitter. Okay. No, I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> and getting the message across. What is it that we're branding? It differs from country to country. It also differs over time both in terms of who sends the signals and which country you're in, which signals, which audience you have in front of you. Uh, it's clear that my job here in, in Hungary is a little bit different from when I was previously posted for six years in Greece as ambassador. Different audience, different messages, some of them are the same. Maybe some of you know Denmark, most of you may not even, but, but if you do, you might know that one of the things that you're quite well known for is, is green economy, uh, renewable energy, uh, green solutions, energy efficiency, things like that. Uh, so no matter where we are, that's something we definitely spend time on uh, talking about and branding them up for. Uh, we also do it for not only to brand our values and ideas uh, and policies, but also to brand our country as, as an exporter, as a country that has something to sell in real life. So there's a lot of cooperation between what we do in more general diplomatic terms and what we do in terms of branding uh, companies and Danish solutions. I think I'll stop there because I, I, I was told to talk for 15 minutes and I, there's a change always in the program, I understand, you know, from, from an hour to now 15 minutes a week ago, I was told, and now five minutes. But I will spend a lot more time talking in a little while. That's, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, since the question was about experience, uh, I'll try to 
try to, to also remember somehow to my experience being ambassador twice in different countries. And uh, uh, first it was Bucharest, Romania, and the second was Moscow, Russia. And again, I just repeat my distinguished colleague here that a different experience. Uh, since I think there are so many Hungarians here, they know that in Bucharest it's not an easy post for a Hungarian ambassador at all. Um, and as to soft power, cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, is also quite a difficult uh, uh, situation. Why? Because we have a large Hungarian minority, which is also um, a Romanian citizen and living in Romania, and uh, uh, somehow part of the public of the country. So if you approach as a Hungarian ambassador the Romanian public, you also approach the Hungarians, but of course the expectations are quite different. So, but I was located in the press. And therefore, my, so the majority of my audience, let's say, of my customers, or what to call them, they were basically Romanians. So the end Romanian uh, capital was the, the host of the so-called Hungarian Cultural Institute, which was the main tool of such culture, cultural activities. Why I use this? Because uh, then there was a pressure that sometimes you have you to extend your activities to the Hungarian, quite large, and something like 150 kilometers. Uh, so, distance uh, Hungarian community. So it was a very complex task, and and my experience was that uh, uh, sometimes even in a difficult situation, which is the Hungarian-Romanian relationship, which was in a very transitional uh, situation, it was the period when Hungary was already a member of the NATO but not the EU. Romania was neither nor, and there was a certain jealousy. There was some kind of political manipulation in war. It was the period of different Hungarian and Romanian steps towards each other, which were not very uh, satisfactory or comfortable. So the, the public was very much uh, indoctrinated by publications, political environment, political uh, uh, declarations, uh, this, that kind of accusations. So in this matter, you focused on those issues, basically, which were very common and which could reach the Romanian and Hungarian uh, uh, societies. This was, for instance, a very interesting tool. As an example, the theater. Theater art is very developed in Romania. Sometimes it's much more developed in Hungary. And there are Hungarian artists also. Transylvanian Hungarian artists who are participating or finishing school. And then they are playing in a Hungarian theater in Transylvania. So there is a, there's a natural partnership between the two kinds of part of the art. And my discovery was that there was already a very intense and professional cooperation between uh, the, the art, uh, the theater art in Hungary or the press and in the press. And they were absolutely uh, refusing any kind of political involvement. It was merely a professional partnership and they very much enjoyed playing together to, to exchange uh, Hungarian registering and uh, director in or vice versa. And what was the outcome? It was a very important start that you could manage or help to, 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 make, to make this uh, cooperation very intense. So in, in this environment, even a very hostile or very uh, manipulated or, or whatever environment, you can find out uh, starting points and enter, and if you are uh, really uh, can make a, a, some kind of breakthroughs, uh, you realize that sometimes uh, uh, it's not as difficult as it looks uh, because of historical problems. Moscow is a different uh, situation. You know, in Central Europe there is a natural uh, mixed feeling about Russia and, and Moscow, uh, being always the, the, you know, the mystic, mystic and distant part of Europe uh, with all this uh, cold and fairs and, and vodka drinking people, whatever it is, and dictatorship, of course, the Tsar, the Bolsheviks, whatever. So, and then, you know, the Hungarian approach and the Czech and the Slovak, whatever it called, because we were satellite countries. We had an infrastructure there, because in the good old socialist times, what was the slogan? The slogan was, but we are a big family, the big socialist camp, this kind of blah, blah, blah. So there was a forced uh, friendship which was very seriously taken by the Russians, and somehow it survived this almost more than two decades of non-socialist cooperation, non-satellite cooperation. 
And still, the Russian, the average Russian people, has a little bit more warm or comfortable feeling towards the Eastern Europeans than to others who were, because under the Bolshevik propaganda, there was a certain interpretation that they are, you know, the enemy, the adversary, and so forth. So, in Moscow, it was, for the first time, a rather easier job because we had the infrastructure. They were built some seven style of 70s or 60s type of cultural centers. There were Soviet people, Russians, and you know, who <coughs> studied whatever reason they had, Hungarian or different other Eastern European languages. So there was a natural audience for you. But at the same time, there was a huge competition because Moscow is a changing place. And I don't want to enter to the most recent political and other developments. It's not the subject. But the average Moscow citizen is changing. They are very much consumers of Western type of blue, blue blackberries, whatever, telephones, bank cards, Western cards, these kind of things. And Facebook and Twitter is an everyday life in Moscow again. So it's a modernizing life, wherever it is uh, strange right now, because of the reasons I don't want to do, that's, a, that's an underline. So what is important, that all the Western big players, soft players, let's say, were there. So they were huge. The Moscow became a very important consumer of global culture, let's say. There were no rock player starting from Madonna and ending with Sting or somebody else who dared not to have a concert in Moscow. There were countries who organized the cultural event. They started in the Louvre and then in the West Korea of Spain. So, so the, 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 the size was so huge that you felt that, okay, you have a certain natural relationship with this country, but at the same time, you are in a terrible competition with others who, who would like to go and they, they are not saving the money, they are not saving the opportunity to be present. So when you are talking about soft power, uh, soft power culture, diplomacy, or whatever you call it, the definition is not clear, even for me, uh, you first have to assess what kind of opportunities and what kind of resources you have, and how the most comfortable, even if everything is um, somehow disadvantages for the first time, right, how you can find your share of the market, let's say, on, on this. Just for the start. Ladies <laughs> first. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And I bet some of you may wonder why am I sitting here and not in the audience because I am just a student just like you. Uh, but I explain you why. Uh, I just finished my studies in Hungary. And right now, uh, I'm living and studying in Denmark. And I'm not only living and studying in Denmark, but I am a member of a student organization which is called the Youth Goodwill Ambassadors of Denmark. And I think it's a very good, a great example of public diplomacy. Me being here as a, as a student, an international student who is studying in Denmark, and this student organization aims to, to brand Denmark internationally as an attractive place to study, to, to attract young talents from different countries, and also to, uh, to brand Denmark as a perfect place to live and study there. And um, I would like to ask you, if, have you heard of the fact that Denmark is the happiest nation on earth? <laughs> have you heard of that? Yeah, you heard of that. And you may have heard of that, but in Denmark, nobody has heard anything about Hungary. And I think that's a big difference, a big difference between the two small countries' public diplomacy. I think Denmark is doing a very good job at public diplomacy in the field of talent attraction and, uh, and the study and uh, intelligence-driven economy. And I think Hungary doesn't really have a clear message doesn't really use the tools of public diplomacy well mm. enough. For example, when I was studying in Denmark, I was often asked if we speak Russian in Hungary, or if we're using the Cyrillic alphabet in Hungary. And I was like, oh my god, you seriously know nothing about my country. And that was weird. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think 
I didn't have to be here. Okay, great. So, um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm honored to be here in this distinguished um, panel. Although I'm neither a diplomat um, um, nor a friend nor a former ambassador, um, they say those who can do it do it, and those who can they teach. So um, by now I'm uh, teaching at Florence University at the uh, Institute of Political Science. I did spend some considerable time in the United States. Um, I received my uh, political science and law degrees in, in Washington, and um, I was there uh, in 2001, 9/11, uh, when um, the attack happened. And um, the reason I bring this up, because I, I saw it with my own eyes, and, and that was a crucial moment um, in the foreign policy for the United States. And it has gained um, a lot of sympathy around the world. And the big question was, what can they do with that sympathy? And I think that relates back to uh, what our moderator was saying in the beginning about the, the theory of Joseph Knight from Harvard University, who said that, um, you know, soft power is all about attraction. When you try to achieve your foreign policy goals, not with coercion or money, but by attracting um, um, others. And, and the sources of, of that attraction are partly cultural um, and, and partly um, your policies that you're pursuing. Uh, no good public uh, diplomacy uh, can help you if you have a bad foreign policy. It doesn't, it doesn't really work. Um, but what uh, Professor Nye was saying that um, if you're fighting a war against transnational uh, terrorist organizations, uh, coercive power by itself will not be sufficient to win that fight. And you also need soft power, as he put, to win over the minds and hearts of others. And uh, what we have seen in the past years, um, some significant efforts on the part of uh, uh, the US State Department to try to at least uh, move into that uh, battlefield as well. But historically, the term public diplomacy was coined in the United States in the 60s, and uh, they, they have called it um, the new diplomacy, as opposed to the old traditional diplomacy when one diplomat uh, was meeting with another diplomat discussing the GSU. And the United States had been successful during the Cold War to use uh, cultural um, and other uh, aspects of public diplomacy uh, to win over hearts and hearts and minds. I think a great example of that was um, in the 70s uh, when the Carter administration decided uh, to make a gesture toward Hungary and they returned the Holy Crown. Uh, if you remember, the crown after World War II was uh, taken to the United States and then the Carter administration in, in, in late 70s said, well, why don't we return this crown back to Hungary? And, and that really was a message, um, not really to the decision makers of, of Hungary, to the government, but to the people of Hungary. And I think that message was quite well received, and, and what the decade that followed after that, I think, um, proved that it was a, a wise move on the part of the United States. Um, but there are some scholars who argue that actually public diplomacy is not the new diplomacy, but it's actually the old ancient art of diplomacy. Um, thousands of years ago, um, the, uh, the way they conducted uh, diplomatic relations was quite different than it is today. Um, there was Professor Nicholson from uh, Georgia University who described that um, in, in ancient Greece, the city-states had such complex political and economic relations that uh, um, they chose ambassadors or envoys based on their ability to speak in public. Because back then, a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the sphere of uh, political debate was in, in the marketplaces, in the forums. So they chose ambassadors and, and envoys who were uh, great speakers so they could represent their countries in front of uh, the citizens of, of the, the city state. Um, the ambassador, I think, um, would have been a great ambassador back then, even to Greece. Back then, I would have been. Yes. <laughs> yeah, soon. Um, and um, in ancient Rome and Africa and so on and so forth. And actually, it was only during the Renaissance uh, when the formal type of uh, 
diplomacy that, as we know it today, was was being established. So it is quite interesting to see how the SOPA new diplomacy is being rediscovered, and, and there are fascinating arguments and debates about its role um, in the world today, in the global environment. Thank you for the introduction. And now let's start the discussion. Um, the first question is, how can the achievement of public diplomacy be measured? Does the past scale exist? In the traditional diplomacy, that's one-on-one. -on -one. You can almost there get a yes or a no, or very shortly after you can get a reaction in the form of a note verbal, a very formal note that says that uh, no, we cannot support this, or yes, we would be happy to support that. Uh, but the whole idea was to get around that, you know, short yes or no. And also, in a lot of areas where we find that maybe we cannot just go and get a yes or a no, but where we need to change, I think you used the expression, the mindset of the people. And that's a long process. So what you're starting one year may not be measured at all until two, three, four, five years later, when this becomes part of the normal mindset of that particular country. Let, let me give you an example. Um, from Afghanistan, so not to jump right into Hungary right now, but Afghanistan. There we had, you know, uh, a war. Uh, dirty, terrible, lots of people killed uh, for reasons that we can also discuss. Uh, peace came about, and today we're trying to fight a new war with soft power. The war of information, it's not only Afghanistan, also for instance Pakistan, other places around there, uh, trying to get the message across that the kind of development that we have seen in the past in those countries, very fundamentalist, is maybe not the right way. I'm looking around here and I seem to see almost two-thirds women. Uh, one of the messages that we from my country are really, really fighting there, using soft power, using public diplomacy, is exactly the right of women to education, to jobs, to speak, uh, and so on and so forth. That's a new war. And it's, how will we measure that? When will we know that we succeeded? For a time we thought we succeeded because we were open, we were seeing schools in Afghanistan opening up you know, to women as well, and not separate schools. Then there was a little backlash. But we're seeing these developments, but slowly, slowly will we see, hopefully, will we be able to almost measure if we had success. Uh, but, but, but that is an ongoing uh, issue there. And definitely with the newest tools, our ambassadors there, my, my colleague who's in Islamabad, for instance, he's on Twitter four or five times a day. Uh, he has thousands of followers. It's quite incredible. I just thought it. I am 19. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I will get there eventually. Uh, not to several thousand. But, but he's getting across. His message is there. He's going out. He's talking to the women. He's talking to the decision makers every day. But you're not going to see the results right now because this is a change not only of some people's mindset, but of the whole culture. And it almost, you know, it takes the form of propaganda sometimes, and that's what we should try to avoid. That's something we may also want to discuss. A narrow line between branding and propaganda. <coughs> you can get some examples, for instance, every year there's a debate in Hungary that we need the formula one which is expensive, which is 
and no noise. And, <clears throat> has no, no purpose, and this is very posh and kind of thing. And then <clears throat> the, the major debate is around the budget, which is to organize it's not cheap, <coughs> cheap uh, 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 exercise. And, uh, and then, you know, the, 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 the owners of the, of the formula race, uh, the brand owners, they say that, okay, but it brings the country additional benefits in hotels, tourism, um, <coughs> restaurants, uh, 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 meals, and whatever. So it's true. Uh, however, nobody could measure really in every, day, every year how, how much money, additional money came from, from after or around the four um, And the, the other approach must be fishing, maybe, that, that if you are sitting somewhere, for Daniel, then, um, you are trying to catch a fish, and after a while, when it's, it's not biting, you have to change the bite, indeed, because it's uh, the only way you, you can move forward. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't, don't know the answer or how to measure it, because of course it's like education. So you have to invest, invest, invest to, to yourself and to the education system in summer after eight, ten years maybe you get some first results and you see that, that you have an educated society and you have uh, something. Uh, I, I, I think it's very significant what the young lady said here. Um, and, and this is very important and this is very demonstrative that there are some people in them who don't complain and go who still consider Hungary to be some kind of Russian, I don't know what. Um, after 10 years of EU membership and uh, whatever, so you can send all from Brussels all the messages that are ah, no, Europe is united, it's never been divided, the country is the same, blah blah blah, we like each other. But it takes time again and it takes at least a Danish and a Hungarian some kind of mutual effort. Because maybe those Danish uh, citizens who think that Hungary is a, some kind of still a Russian province or something, they think that. Bohemia is still a Russian province, or I don't know what, because do we like it or not, for 40 whatever years, uh, Europe was so divided, and we, uh, because of under the, the, the threat of a nuclear holocaust, uh, the two parts of Europe basically ignored each other, and we considered each other that ah, this is a West which we never can visit, we never can see, or, or maybe Hungary was a little but 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 it is a non-existent good for us and Western Europe could live fantastically good without Eastern Europe. So they can manage and ah, this is a Russian war. God bless them. So that's it. So it needs a common effort if it's all even in Europe where no such huge cultural differences like for instance as uh, his excellency's example between Afghanistan and Denmark or Afghanistan and Hungary. Uh, because of the Asian, European, Islamic, whatever, Christian, these are so many traditions, you know, the values, the difference in values. But even in the heart of Europe, we, we are not fulfilling, as this example shows, our task, and this is a measure. If you still find in the heart of Europe people who don't know each other, who, who have to end, of course, it's a generation of things, because you have uh, 100 times more opportunities like me in the US, I never went to uh, there, there was no chance to go to that. Therefore, I know we just say that, where is my ticket? I go to Copenhagen for the next weekend, you know, Christiania or something. So that's it. And, and okay for your generation, it's cultural diplomacy or it's public diplomacy, because we are in the age of that many can visit many, uh, through Twitter or by physical contact, because you can travel, cheap travel. <clears throat> Diplomacy in the so-called uh, old-fashioned Cold uh, War type, it was contact between few and few, because this was the rule of the game. We were isolated from each other, we were not allowed to communicate. Why? Because the two, um, let's say, political system didn't want to communicate. They didn't want to demonstrate that probably they can learn, they can love, they can I mean, have anything with each other.
I think um, if you ask how do you measure public diplomacy, how do you, how do you measure uh, soft power, you know, I think it's important to know that power often is associated with perception. You perceive someone to be powerful. Um, it's a question of narratives. You know, whose narrative is, uh, resonates uh, better with some people? It was uh, Dr. Cole at the uh, University of Southern California who said that uh, you know, public diplomacy has five components, and the first component is listening. The ability to successfully listen to the population or the public in that given country that you would like to influence. And among other uh, factors is it, um, culture, and international broadcast exchange is a very important aspect, which you are a great example of um, as you are participating in an exchange program, or as I was uh, participating in an exchange program. But I think, um, I think in that aspect, we could actually measure uh, the perception. Um, let, me, let me ask you guys, um, if I gave you tomorrow full scholarship to study four years, United States University, please raise your hand if you, any of you would like to go. Okay, good. Now, if I give you a full scholarship to study four years at a Russian university, please raise your hand if you'd like to go. Okay, two. All right, so that's two. Now, what I was trying to demonstrate in a non-scholarly fashion um, is that what just happened now is we, we measured your perception of public diplomacy from a U.S. perspective and public diplomacy from a Russian perspective. Because make no mistake, um, every power is trying to practice the art of public diplomacy. It seems like um, if you ever uh, go to the U.S. Embassy, you see a, a big poster with a beautiful American uh, university there with the um, uh, sun is shining and smiling student says, come study in the U.S. Um, I don't know what posters they have uh, at the Russian embassy. I've never been there, but uh, um, but I do know that Russia and China and India and all the emerging powers are struggling with the concept of soft power. First, what they've tried to do, for instance, Russians. Um, first, they tried to emulate and copy the American way of of public diplomacy, but then they realized that they have to adapt and and fill that with their own content because as we talk about culture and, uh, and policies and their values. Those are important factors. So what the Russians said, okay, we got culture. We got great Russian culture. So let's talk about, try to export that. Talk about Dostoevsky and, 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 and Tchaikovsky and, and, and the great part that they have. And then a question of values, okay? Uh, what kind of political values uh, can Russia uh, show that they can attract, uh, let's say, uh, uh, European audiences or countries. Well, um, what they try to do is say, we believe in a multi-polar uh, world. We, we don't like hegemony. We don't like there's only one power, one superpower. We think that there should be more powers. And it kind of actually resonates in Western Europe according to surveys. They started uh, Russian television, which has attracted um, some considerable audience. Uh, surprisingly, not only right-wing or fringe political parties in, in, in Europe, but also left-leaning audiences in Western Europe who like the Russian narrative. And, um, and so I think it's important for every country to have a, a strong uh, public diplomacy component and, um, and to be able to measure it also. Uh, and speaking of these uh, elements, steps, uh, how to listen to foreign publics is the first step. So what do you consider the best way to collect opinions and attitudes to make a good public diplomacy strategy? <coughs> what do you think of using intelligence services or data mining for this purpose? Data mining. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm just really ignorant. I'm working on the data okay. mining is. You know, what? I'm sure some uh, people at the NSA would be able to. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not mine. Like your uh, Facebook. Oh. I think it's not even that necessary nowadays. 
-hmm. Hacking is not even that necessary nowadays. They can just buy it from Google or yes. Android and find your location and everything. Mm -hmm. and they know yes. about you. But I think the, the outset, before you start looking at the form public that you're talking to, you have to, but it's a combination, but you have to start out with what, what you have to sell. I mean, you have to have a certain idea of where you want to go. So that's, that's the first, the identification. Of, and I was mentioning, for instance, the green economy as, as one thing that we have been spending a lot of time and energy and money, resources are definitely uh, trying to promote. But, so you find an issue, something that positively brands your own country. Then you have to look at the audience and find out, is there resonance there? Would, would you at all consider that there's any resonance with the public in a given country? And I, I, I think, to be quite honest, we, we're not spending a hell of a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Let me just go back to uh, Pakistan and, and uh, Afghanistan. We're not spending a hell of a lot of time there trying to promote green energy, green solutions. It's, it's not really what we're doing there. So we target individually. We have to do a short list. But since we're also, I mean, we're very good at the green stuff. We are actually, just this week, I think, this month, the Global Green Economy Index uh, declared uh, Copenhagen, my capital, the greenest city in the world, and Denmark, the fourth greenest country in the world. So we're, we're definitely good at that, as she also said. We're also very happy. Uh, <laughs> not because of that. Uh, but, but we're also very high, scoring very high on uh, gender equality, uh, according to the, uh, the Global Gender Equality uh, Gap Report. We are, together with the other four uh, Nordic countries, actually, uh, we're, we're number one. Those, those are the five foremost. So there, we have another thing that we like to brand, but you know, we're not spending a hell of a lot of time branding that in the other Nordic countries. It's already there waste of time. But that's what we're doing, for instance, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Uh, we have a fairly good school system. It's definitely not the best in the world. But, but we're doing okay. So we're also branding that. We're in, in terms of continuing education in Europe. We also rank number one, but that's, there are many other statistics who are not ranking very well on education. So, so you have to first identify what are we good at? What do we want to sell, brand? Uh, throw out uh, in, into the big world. And then you have to target it individually to each country. Uh, and again, you have to be very careful about the media that, that you use, the methods that you use, because also there, it has to be individually targeted. So you cannot sit back home and have a strategy saying, I, I think that would be wrong, saying, now we are Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, mass bombing the whole world with all that, because some places it's simply not going to be very interesting. Uh, other places it might. Mm -hmm. So you have to use your methods also, tailor-made to the situation. Uh, and then we're all still beginners. We're not like the Americans who started it in the 60s, you said. Uh, we're, we're, we're just starting up, I guess. Uh, that would be my first comment on that. Well, I think a great way to start the listening is by, by asking. Uh, most, um, many embassies um, actually, or, or, or foreign ministries, conduct surveys, public opinion surveys, and, and that's the most simple way to, to get one type of uh, information. And of course, there are some intelligence services to obtain certain other type of information, but I think if you're trying to, uh, I mean, you don't need a spy agency to find out uh, how a public views a country, like the United States. Uh, but then there are other levels of, of listening to, to the public. Um, recently there was a controversy about uh, the, um, the US uh, DCM, uh, Mr. Goodfriend, being present at a demonstration. And um, he pointed out that um, he goes to every demonstration that there is in town. I'm sure he's quite busy late, uh, recently, but um, that, that he goes pro-government, anti-government demonstration to, to gauge um, the size of the crowd and, 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 and the mood and everything else. And that's also an important part um, of, of listening. Um, but if you don't listen to what the population uh, thinks about your foreign policy, then 
then your, your strategy cannot be successful because you don't know how to um, advocate um, your own uh, agenda. Just to add on to that, when I was in Greece, I would say right away now so that you don't put me in the same boxes as otherwise nice guy and very good friend. I have not so far participated in a demonstration here. Also, some of them have been over the weekends, so I've been away on the weekends. So, but, but in Greece, where we had many demonstrations, I went to quite a lot of them, uh, quite a lot, for two purposes. One was exactly like that, as you're saying, to gather, to, to find the sentiment. What's behind this? Why, why are people reacting the way they are? We're, we're talking about 20,000, 30,000 people in violent demonstrations, not these, what I would call, extremely soft and well-behaved uh, demonstrations that we've seen here. We're talking about throwing, uh, some were even bringing weapons to the demonstrations, so tear gas all over the place. I don't know if anybody has ever tried to be in a tear gas demonstration. It's, it's really an experience. Um, <laughs> but I did it to, to gather information what's happening here but also, uh, and to, to sense what's wrong, but what, what are people feeling? Why are they reacting the way they are? Uh, but I also did it, and that's another part that we also have to talk about, uh, I think, the media and the press, because that's something very new for us diplomats. We used to be well-behaved, uh, and whenever the press would call us, we had one comment, and that is, we had no comments. So that was, you know, you would see, the, the, the newspapers would frequently quote Danish diplomats saying no comment. That, that's all they got from us. We were a closed society and people didn't understand what we were doing. Now it's different. We are on the media. We are active in the media. We are certainly we're all training our ambassadors and others to, to actually deal with the media. Also the media back home. In Greece, in my case, I spent a lot of time being on live television and live radio and, and otherwise for them back home. So I also did uh, Okay, uh, FaceTime uh, interviews, standing in the middle of the demonstrations, live on Danish television, it worked quite well, uh, to inform the people back home. Uh, it was also very good for the Danish television stations because they saved a lot of money, they didn't have to send out any journalists. <laughs> I'm already paid, so. <clears throat> if I may add something to this, uh, there'll be historians know that, that uh, there is a very valuable resource of the medieval Hungarian history, these are the reports of the Venice ambassador back to Venice about the Hungarian situation, but usually so Venice considered to be the father of classical diplomacy because the, um, making business, it was very necessary to have a history of all over the world, and they reported what is the situation and all the businesses in Definitely, Venice had uh, an ambassador in, in Istanbul. And usually, the ambassador's uh, role, and later it continued, that you had to escort the head of the state, in this case, the Sultan. And when the Sultan went out for a political campaign, military campaign, in some cases in Hungary, uh, so the, the ambassador escorted with the, with the court. And uh, when it was in Hungary, in the case of the we are mostly finished history, right? Yes. Okay, so it's, it was the 15th year, years war, and, and the Venice reports, the Venice ambassador, it was very, 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 very valuable to, to, to you know, you know, to study what the history is. But there were no record that the Venice ambassador ever participated in an attack in a Hungarian castle or something. So, so for diplomats, it's not necessary to participate in a demonstration if you would like to measure. Even, I think, don't think so that the, the center is interested in because how, how can one person from the demonstration measure the size of it? So and, and the, you, you, you what you make, I participated in several countries, also not in, in demonstrations, but I watched demonstration. And it was very interesting that the participants reported that we are one hundred thousand, the police and the government reported that no, we are five hundred, five thousand or something like that. And then you measure it again that how many is that? But this is classical diplomacy, and I don't want to comment further on this, that who participates where. Well. Uh, what is important, and I would like to also continue, uh, 
that sometimes uh, things are, are, are uh, working very well. Let's have another example. Iran, which we know that not in a very good terms with the US, and it started with the 70s, and the, uh, you know, the crisis just deepened, and still we cannot say that, that uh, the US and Tehran in good terms. But there were two companies never left Iran, even in the deepest of the crisis. It was Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. <laughs> and still the perception of the US and the American lifestyle is very high, which is in a large, slight contradiction of the fact that the U.S. policy is not appreciated. So we have to divide two things and, and somehow forget that it's a very bad heritage of the Cold War, that policy and public perception has to be the same. It's not. Thanks God. So sometimes you, you can have problems on diplomatic and political level, and that's why still passive diplomacy exists. But in the same time, people to people contacts can easily go on. And unfortunately, sometimes it's manipulated, but still it's very important that I just want to continue uh, the professor's thesis on that or the position on that. That, uh, of course, uh, this, there's a large difference between so called big cultures or great cultures and smaller cultures. It's very hard to compete culture like the US and Britain and others. When English is dominating, we, we still speak in English, right? So why not Russian? Why not Chinese or whatever? Russia is Russia is spoken. Russian is spoken by, I mean, even probably in numerical more than English in the United States. Chinese, you cannot compete China with number. But in the same time, the English is so widely spoken that you cannot refuse. And then everything which is on English, having a very smooth speak or go forward. So Danish and Hungarian is not so widely speak. So again, you have a double two, you have to switch to English words, and then you can just sell your little products, being it, I mean, a good Danish butter or a Hungarian salami. Well, uh, answering the original question, uh, the Soviet Union was not because I also think that small states need to find something like a segment or a little piece of information or feature which, which can be communicated and which can be identifiable internationally. So, for example, I don't know if you remember, but during the EU presidency in 2011, Hungary had this country image as the world of potentials. And like firstly, oh my God, how can you say a world of potentials when there are more people going outside the country st statistically than coming inside. So it's like the message is, is, is not that good, you see. And like how can you say the word of potential? It's, it's not clear, it's not identifiable, it's something very vague. So uh, I think if you are a small country, just as Mr. Nering says, you, have, you need to find something very specific specific goal which you want to communicate and then you can be successful. And uh, also uh, to the previous question, how can we measure um, the efforts of public diplomacy? I think it's very hard to measure, but still just mentioning an example, I'm studying in Denmark in a small city with like three uh, 300,000 people, but still there are more international students in that small city than in whole Budapest. So uh, I think it's very interesting and the results of this maybe can be measured after decades because these exchange students will be back in their countries and will be leaders of companies or whatever after decades. So it's very hard to measure but still it's, it's something to think about. Thank you. you said something before yeah. which led me to, to think about one word, credibility. Yeah. Whenever you do nation branding, public diplomacy, whatever, it has to be credible. Yeah. Uh, because it's, 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 it's counterproductive, it's seriously counterproductive mm -hmm. if you are nation branding without content. That will be eventually found out, and it's going to be on the minus side, you're going to lose more points than you're winning. So but credibility, and I think you, you mentioned Joseph Nile. I think in his book and his theories and everything, he also works very much with the credibility issue. 
soft power puppy diplomacy has to be credible. If it's not credible, forget it. It's the most important question. Uh, I mean, how do you distinguish propaganda from public diplomacy? If you ask any uh, diplomat, they'll tell you what, what I do is public diplomacy, but the other guys do. That's propaganda. But always say that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the issue about to be incredible and believable. I mean, how can you convince someone if you're not believable? If you're not credible, your message. So it's very important to be truthful in what you're trying to say. Um, there are cases when a government or a state needs to send uh, disinformation, information that's false. That's, that's part of, part of uh, you know, propaganda effort. Um, but if we talk about public diplomacy, uh, when you're not trying to coerce or buy off someone, but to attract uh, to your policies, then truthfulness and credibility are very important. Um, another aspect um, that I, I wanted to um, point out is there was um, a famous debate um, that happened by accident during the Cold War. I think it was in 1959 when the, the, the United States organized um, an exhibition in Moscow during the Cold War. It was an exhibition of, uh, of American um, items, and uh, they built a little American uh, model house, and they cut it in half so the visitors in Moscow can see how Americans live. And the Vice President uh, Nixon visited the exhibit, and, um, and uh, the head of uh, the, the Soviet uh, state, um, Mr. Khrushchev, was there, and they, they started a, a little debate, because what Nixon said, uh, please take a look at this house, uh, what you see over there is, uh, a dishwasher and then he went on to explain well you know we have these dishwashers to make it easier on housewives uh, to do their chores now it was back in 1959 and Khrushchev said well uh, we don't follow these capitalist ideals on, uh, on women and uh, he said well no it's a universal ideal of, of, of helping uh, um, of, of housewives <coughs> and, and the whole point was that what Nixon was trying to say it was based on the truth and the fact um, that you know innovation um, and, and consumerism in that aspect uh, could help people people's lives. And when they broadcasted that um, debate on Russian television and in American television, I think it became clear uh, the big difference. What Khrushchev could not see that ideology and propaganda, what you're trying to say, if that does not meet with reality, they can backfire. You mentioned media and e diplomacy, like Facebook and Twitter. But uh, can it uh, spread effectively if just almost the one third of the world has internet access? What do you mean for spread effectively if they have? It can exactly as well. But uh, we uh, don't have. We don't have. Mm -hmm. It can be a problem okay. for. I think, I think it's very ambitious if you think that we can reach the whole global population of 6 billion people anyway. So I think in, in, in my personal ambition level, I would go a little lower and say, I'm, I would be really happy if I can reach one third. If I can reach myself on Twitter, 2 billion people, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. So I'm, I'm not so worried about that. And then, but again, as I said before, you have to target the audience in, in, in places where they do not have. It doesn't help then you will have to find different means of getting your message across. And again, and, and, and there are many ways. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that we're going to change the whole world, because I have a friend who's wa running around in Islamabad preaching gender equality and, and education for, for women and, and girls, and, and, and talking or, or in the Horn of Africa and talking about uh, you know, stopping this women's uh, mutilation and all these things. And it, no, of course. Uh, that you cannot just do everywhere. You have to find your, your ways. And also, I'm, I'm pretty proud to be uh, representing a country that spends quite a lot of money, uh, taxpayer money, 1% of our GDP in total, goes to uh, foreign uh, development assistance in foreign countries. That's another way. But it's not public diplomacy, but it's public diplomacy combined with uh, 
payment happens. And we're, we're, we're also getting through messages in the, in, in the continent of Africa through the, a lot of bilateral development assistance and public diplomacy. So you, you, but, but I mean, if, if one third of the global population has access to internet, I thought, I'm, I'm not doing enough to get around that. But of course, there's another problem there. Again, if you look at Hungary, you, know, you can get through to the people in Budapest because they have access. But if you look countrywide, it's a different story. So if you want to uh, somehow get the message across, then you have to, again, think in, in variable ways. You but cannot, you cannot, you cannot travel the country. Mm -hmm. I know it's, no. it's tiresome, it takes a long time uh, to go out, but, but you have to target the, the province. You cannot just target the capital. And again, to go to the whether you should go to demonstrations or not, I'm not going there to count the people. I go there to sense the, the emotions and why people are acting the way they are. Uh, but but you also have to go out. You cannot sit here in Budapest and understand Hungary as a diplomat. I think that's a, that's wrong. If you want to influence, well, then you have to set up meetings. Uh, I haven't traveled so much yet in, in the rest of the country here. In Greece, I did quite a lot, uh, and I would always set up meetings with the local politicians, but also open meetings, discussions, where they would, we would organize with some organization there, a discussion on certain issues of, of importance that I found of importance. Dangerous to say that you use the media. <laughs> um, I just want to continue what uh, my distinguished colleague started. That uh, yes, media is very important. I, I, you know, in this room, everybody uses internet, right? Other exceptions, right? This is the, your generation, the Y generation. I think it's a new term we have to learn. Uh, when I was in your age, internet was not there. In, uh, but we still knew something. We went to libraries, like, I don't know, books, maybe books. <laughs> <laughs> so there were so many opportunities, starting from the ancient times, you know, with Hammurabi, with famous <laughs> keramic something. So um, this is human communication, and, and we can mystify it, but, but even in the age of Gutenberg and uh, later the computer, it was absolutely up to you. Did you, or do you want to have access to information or you don't? That's why I don't blame anybody who has created the interest in the internet. As far as I, I follow my boys, sometimes even the majority of the time is spent with rubbish. I mean, this, I don't know what. So please, if you look into your zoos, how many valuable time you spend on the internet learning, I don't know. So most of the time you use it for different chatting, I don't know. Following some interesting things, uh, videos, whatever. I watch films, for instance, which is not necessarily my profession, I think, but sometimes I would ask with that. Uh, not about films, but sorry. So <clears throat> it means that, that um, it, it is uh, in this age of bombing yourself with information through the internet, it is very seldom happening that even the most targeted public diplomacy can through this go through this and go targeting into the, your desktop. Uh, what you can do, you can find out other ways to somehow boost your interest then to look for uh, that particular country which successfully reached something. And it's still the media and it's still some events you can organize. It's a good concert, it's a good program, it's a good exhibition. So that's why there is an interesting mixture. So you cannot turn everything into a digital version. Uh, you still need, it's still programmed to go out for a while, watch a good exhibition, have a good movie somewhere. So you can sit a lot in front of the, your computer, but time to time you even, you, you, you have the, the feeling to, to go to do something else. And that's why you have to, to send some kind of mixed messages. I mean, still, uh, somebody said that 
why you are sending over with huge expenses some kind of artworks and theater or a dance group or something because this is the way this is the way you catch I just recently returned back from Indonesia when I went to a shop simple supermarket and I was astonished that we had the same products so the Colgate two spice these that so the major brands covered everything and people are tired of it, you know, and they want to see something unique, something. Uh, I, I just recently uh, 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 visited my good friend who is a winemaker, not the biggest in Hungary, and he's selling wine in California. And I said, it's, not, it's something like selling ice to the Eskimos, how do you do that? And he said that somehow they found me, and then they said that the Californian people, uh, I got sick and tired with Italian, French, and Napa Valley wine. I know I'm drinking Hungarian because it's very boshy and very I mean, cool. And I'm selling them. That's it. How they could get me and the Hungarian wine, I don't know, but I'm still selling it. Just one thought, a very short one about uh, electronic diplomacy. I think there's one crucial aspect of public diplomacy when, when e diplomacy <clears throat> is very important. And that is a question of uh, you know, how do you combat um, um, the issue of uh, the terrorism? radical Islam uh, has been very successful in, in occupying um, spheres and, and, and dominating conversations online and websites and chats about uh, these issues and sending out videos and so on and so forth. So the, the U.S. State Department um, under the Under Secretariat of Public Diplomacy created a section that's called uh, uh, Strategic Counterterrorism uh, Communications um, where they have a digital outreach unit whose job is to in their native language, go into these uh, chat sites and websites and and and, and argue and, and debate uh, these issues. Um, I think they, they have in four languages like Urdu and uh, uh, Punjabi and, and, and Arabic, and they and they have um, an English language a digital outreach group too. And if you click on their uh, a Twitter feed, it's called uh, Think and Turn Away. Uh, which is a message, I guess, to uh, Western European uh, young um, wannabe Islamic fighters who, who are entertaining the romanticized notion of, of going uh, to the Middle East and, and fighting uh, a jihad. And I guess uh, that's their way of trying to reach out to them or, or warn them very sternly to uh, not to do that. I wish we could have drawn Muhammad uh, in different ways which was perceived by the Muslim community or some in the Muslim community, I would say, as, as uh, you know, really something that, that was, uh, should never happen, we should have apologized, our government should have interfered. This was a very, very complex situation. But I'm picking up on this because what happened to that was what we had not thought about. It's not so many years ago. It was in 2006, I think. It was less than 10 years ago. We did not anticipate how fast the electronic communication was on the other side. Information went out globally so fast to so many people. It generated an enormous reaction in, uh, in a lot of love. I, I even had to find out now and you mentioned it. You said it. But it was not until then I found out in Indonesia the largest community in the world. I uh, had no idea. Uh, Malaysia, very good and so on. Created a big crisis for Denmark because they had demonstrations, but the demonstrations that went a lot. They were burning things, and this is something that usually is only for the Americans to experience, but we were, we were a superpower for a while. Uh, not a very happy one, but it worked so incredibly fast, and it was impossible for us to counter this. I wish we would have had access to that American unit because they might have been able to help us, but they didn't exist 10 years ago, I think. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, and I can tell you one little teeny mini story, and this is also about credibility and about how fast it works. Suddenly appeared yet another caricature, you know, that was really uh, threatening the whole picture. It was a picture of a man wearing a pig's nose. Of course, Muslims uh, have not eat pork meat, 
And this was seen as you know, really, really, really terrible uh, message from Denmark. We had nothing to do with it. It was spread to millions of people so fast on the internet. We couldn't counter it. We couldn't do anything. The reality was this was a picture of a French farmer from a little French village where they grow pigs. And every year they have the yearly pig festival. Okay? Yeah, I'm sure you have one somewhere here in Hungary also. I'm also sure we have it in Denmark some kind of festival like that. It was taken from there, but you couldn't counterattack this. It was in the world of fast information, it was impossible to stop. And it you know just led to a few more demonstrations and we had another uh, attack embassy somewhere. It was incredible. How do you deal with it? But it, that's the negative side of it. But it also says how important and strong and forceful, powerful the electronic media are. Oh. referring back to this American unit and referring back to this public diplomacy versus propaganda, I think it's very important to highlight that uh, these terrorist units can also use uh, these um, social media websites and they can also, they can use propaganda and for example this American unit that you just mentioned, now they are trying to um, tell the people that uh, the Islamist propaganda is wrong, like, have you heard of today's scandal about the picture which the IS uses to, uh, to collect fighters to the coast? And this American unit tried to explain on Twitter that the picture that the terrorists are using and spreading across the internet is, um, is wrongly interpreted. And that's very interesting because uh, Access to uh, to social media websites uh, can cause like a good way of propaganda for a terrorist unit and uh, a nice way for democratic states for public diplomacy. But it's a two very different things can be used as like um, two ways. If you know what I mean. The last sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the word I'm searching for. Okay, so to finish our discussion, I have just one question. Um, is it uh, public diplomacy is the legal complement of uh, traditional diplomacy, or is it just any kind of propaganda? A short answer. What <laughs> 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 kind of propaganda? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> the short answer is it's, it's a supplement, it's a complementary instrument. Mm -hmm. As I think uh, the Minister of State also said, you, there's still going to be classical diplomacy. You need it. With, with the ambassador, it's only hope for us, if, but still diplomacy has a meaning. I mean, it's, uh, it's very good. It means that you can continue somehow. And diplomacy still has a special meaning because you can add in terms of somewhere in the context, like public. Um, uh, because the world is still very traditional, however modern and progressive, but very traditional, and it, it's very, still very good to call Lady Diana, sorry, the late Lady Diana, to be a, a dip, diplomat of England, or public diplomat, one of uh, Beckham, and the footballist, yes, 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 also a diplomat. So we, we easily give this title to, well, known personalities to represent something valuable to act again because diplomacy is probably still about values and uh, and you know to some of this. Um, <clears throat> if you if you understand diplomacy or public diplomacy in a broad, broader sense, every move can be a diplomatic one or, or can be so I mean uh, whatever if, if you have a good image and you represent the country well this is again a diplomatic act or can it be? I think uh, it's not a tragedy that we mix up a little bit this. Uh, because do we like it or not, or be diplomat? The world is a globalized one. So the, the conduct between people has significantly changed. And these good old times of the 20th century when, when the state structure was so rigid. I mean, it's a very unique century of the 20th because even in the 19th century, up to the First World War, there were no passports, there were no borders in, in Europe. So you, 
could live in, in an empire and you just have, if, if you have money enough to, to travel from this part of Europe to that part of Europe. So when, when we are trying to say Schengen is a good thing and again borderless Europe, it's not a, it's not a fantastic step forward. It's again that we hardly get rid of the heritage of the, of the Cold War. But in the 19th and 18th century, regardless of the fact that there were still wars in Europe and this confrontation, mm -hmm. that I don't know what, hunger, I don't know, epidemics, but the people were traveling and there were much more cities in Europe than countries or, or borderlines. So the human being is not as inventive. Uh, sometimes it's, it's able to step back on the mission. So therefore, I think, uh, the meaning of diplomacy and this kind of conduct uh, is much more carrying uh, some kind of frustration coming from the Cold War and the big confrontation, the global confrontation and, and the nuclear war threat. Then the development of it still happened something like 20 years. And therefore I think it's very important that do not, uh, I mean, be frightened to use diplomacy or public diplomacy, I don't think so that the meaning has a real importance. The content has the real importance. So that if there is an, a, an opportunity to get closer to each other in a, in a massive level, that's the most important thing. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Well, on the propaganda side, I would like to add, because I mean, I'm still, I'm, I'm allowed to be in the propaganda business. So I'm going to put some propaganda cards here, up here, uh, all around. Uh, you're welcome to take them. They're not my business cards. They are uh, simply propaganda for Denmark, or rather for the Facebook of the Danish Embassy. And then you can learn about Denmark. You're welcome to take them. Uh, that is propaganda. <laughs> but, but, I, but I hope I'm not making propaganda for something that is ridiculous or, or uh, illegal or leads to either Islamic wars or, or, or other kinds of, 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 of bad things. But, but please take one when, when you're on your way out. Uh, I would be happy to spread that kind of thing. Thanks. Uh, Andy, it's your time. You are present. Thank you. Uh, I My question is, um, if you know any, anything about this, um, how developed is um, new this new kind of diplomacy, this this online media and, and branding in, in the in the country in each individual country's um, diplomatic strategy? So is it something that is so you know developed that they at, at every yearly meeting or I don't know where they sit down and think, okay, what's going to be our strategy this year? What are we going to put the key um, accents on? What are we going to brand? this year or is it just something that is kind of you know in development not so much or, or I can't really imagine so is this is this like a, a developed program or, or a nationwide thing that is already done every year? My question. I think you just enumerated the, the varieties. <laughs> and, uh, so, no, no, it differs. You know, um, sometimes it's an organized something too. The U.S. had the U.S. and the, the, I don't know how many organizations they have. The Brits have the British Council, which is also, you know, uh, they have to make a plan about The French are the most sophisticated. The French invented, not because there is the Institut Francais, uh, there are language courses, there are, and, and the French put a huge accent on, on the campaigns. So the, the culture of years, maybe. Which is very good, it needs a lot of money, but you know, it's coming from the global or the lost of the global. So the French really would like to reestablish a certain influence, which in a very Anglo Saxon world is not very easy. But anyway, um, exactly what I want to do in my department this is planning and branding and networking. Because the Hungarian culture of diplomacy is. So I, I, I have to miss that it is still very much a Cold War country uh, coming from the, uh, you know, let's have some four groups, some artists, blah, 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 blah. So we definitely don't, and this is very bad. So I, I was astonished by the, the frankness of, of this very statement that yeah, we have to focus on Denmark. 
uh, probably the Danish may not receive the message, but I definitely have to send it out and find out why they are not receiving and what is the Danish how to get through the Danish uh, stone block heads uh, to, to get more information. <laughs> about I sell that long. And, and the Danish will not change. I have to change my strategy, maybe. So I, I have to plan a Danish activity. And then, because I'm, so my country is not selling for itself just like that, like the Brits. I don't like this whole professor name about Russia, because I was in Russia for four years. Uh, and I watched that Russia is becoming popular. Uh, not as a student place, but young people are coming anyway. But as student life, you cannot imagine how many clubs, clubs, whatever. So in Moscow in the evening, if you try, I'm not a propaganda of Russia. <laughs> but if you just catch the, <clears throat> the flight from here, the cheap one, I don't sell the car. I don't have to say it. <laughs> and go there, in, in Saturday evening, you cannot differ probably London and Moscow. And so many, there's two million students in, in just Moscow. They are Russians, of course, not foreigners. But so many foreigners are coming. And there is huge life. Because young generations, so they are not Soviets anymore. Come on, not Putinists. They are young people, like you, like everybody. I want to have party. And everybody says who stays permanent. And uh, there is an expert colony in, in, in Moscow as well. And they say that Moscow is fantastic. So yeah, probably the adults have to work. It's cold. It's too many vodka. <laughs> they don't want to go home. They like it. So, so Moscow, Moscow and, and Russia are supposed to develop their foreign policy to no, no, they're to spread this message. <laughs> no, no, no. no. If right, they right, did, they would get the message across. <laughs> and, and again, it's very important. It's sorry being. Uh, um, and that's why the values and probably democracy matters. Because the Russians, Russian politics still carries the burden of the Soviet past. So they really don't understand that this is important. It's never been. The Soviet people had no say about where, how, and when the country goes. It was the Kremlin and the local um, nomenclature of the Soviet party system. So the the, the public was non-existing. I mean, why do we have to make a public diplomacy if we don't take into the consideration the public opinion? And that's why they cannot understand. They, they consider that democracy or public opinion is a weakness and not a strength. So you are not establishing policy on weaknesses, right? So that's why they don't understand the, the mere play of the play. So that's why. Uh, Interestingly, the society develops much rapidly than the political system. And that's why Russia is a very controversial, controversial uh, society right now. But just to answer the question, what do countries do? Is it new or is it, has it been uh, there all, all the time? For my own country, public diplomacy as such has existed for the last somewhere around 10 years as something that we have focused consciously on within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and yes, we now have fairly clear strategies as to how to work the different scenarios and different areas of public diplomacy because it's, it's really very diverse. And I, I, but, but also before that, of course, we had plans, but there it was more the traditional focus on culture and, and spreading the, the message about our cultural, what, what we had to offer in the field of culture. Uh, we're still doing that. I think it's still very important. Uh, we're not doing it under the, the broader umbrella of public diplomacy, uh, but, it, but it's covering a lot more. But, but just to, to mention, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be in Budapest when it comes to spreading culture, because as opposed to when I was in Greece before, and I'm not just saying bad things about Greece, I'm married to a Greek woman, so I, I have a lot of respect for Greece also. But I simply couldn't sell Danish culture in Africa. If I had a Danish screening of a Danish movie, or man, be it jazz, classic, pop, they couldn't care less. I would get the same 50, 15, not 50, 15 <coughs> Danes who came for the, the glass of wine afterwards, and that, that was it. I simply couldn't sell it. I can promise you here, whenever we do something, and again, if you pick up the, the little cards there, you might want to just go through our Facebook page once in a while. 
we have a lot of people coming to our cultural events. Very impressed by that. The Danish movie also has been doing very well the last 10 years or so. Really, we've had a lot of uh, very, very uh, successful directors and, uh, and so on. We've got several uh, Oscars that helps. Uh, but, you know, people come here. It's great. Uh, and just one little ad, not propaganda, but one little ad. And some may say that there's propaganda in it. Uh, just this week, we are uh, screening, having premiere here in Budapest on uh, a Danish documentary. Most people don't really want to go watch documentary films. It's like my documentary. But this one is very interesting. It's very interesting in, an, in a Hungarian context. It's called simply 1989. It's long, it's one and a half hour, and it's basically what happened in Hungary leading up to what happened in Berlin in the fall of the, uh, the, the Berlin Wall. It's a one angle to what happened because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, focusing on how Nikos Nemet, the Prime Minister, then, how he saw the developments. It's based on his own story. Of course, there are other stories, there's Gila Horn and many other people who also had a story to, 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 to tell, or he doesn't tell it anymore. But other people have a story to tell. And it's a very interesting one. And actually, I think today, Miklas Nemet has a book that is being published. I think it's actually, uh, yeah, is it being launched uh, right now, as we speak, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? No, with the support. With the support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's in the uh, concurrent university, I don't have to say that. Okay. <laughs> but this is how we, you know, share the, the responsibility. I'm sitting here and somebody else is over there. So the Danish instructor or director, together with, it's a co-production, together with a, a, a Hungarian uh, director, are right now with Nicholas Nemet, but he's presenting his book there, but they're also sh showing uh, uh, bits and pieces from this documentary. But anyway, I just want to say, Yes, we definitely have a clear strategy, and it changes every year. We were slow in our nation branding, so not until last year did we start really looking at, a couple of years ago, looking at Facebook. We thought the home pages of our embassies were sufficient. Found out nobody goes there. There's no visit to a, a website anymore. Like this, you know, they visit their Facebook. Maybe that will be over in a few years, I don't know, but right now we're focusing on that. And just from this year, we are starting to do Twitter, so it's very good. But there's a conscious strategy, a plan, and we will revise it every year. Thank you. Well, it's not easy, if I may add. I mean, just imagine uh, an ambassador, a classical diplomat, who was trained, you know, decades ago in the arts of diplomacy, who probably speaks French, and uh, is, is prepared and trained to negotiate with other diplomats. And, and that's the world and universe of uh, you know, cocktails and so on that, 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 that they live in, being trained in, in being excellent at that. And it's, it's rather different from, from being able to come to a university uh, and, and, and to engage with students and, and uh, to talk about your country. If you paid attention uh, it's really scary. To, to the ambassador's uh, <laughs> answers, he was always able to put in some nice statistics about how great uh, Denmark is. And that's, that's, it's a fantastic uh, I have experience more. of <laughs> I mean, an example of all diplomacy. What the Americans have done in 1999, they merged the agency that was responsible for foreign information. They merged it with the uh, with the State Department, and uh, they took some um, you know, pragmatic uh, changes, made some pragmatic changes in how they trained their uh, the diplomatic corps. They have around 11,000 uh, foreign service people. That's a lot of diplomats, and. Uh, and they created certain tracks, uh, uh, you know, media track and economic track. But, but of those, I think it's a 10-year-old statistic, but um, they have about um, 1,100 um, public diplomacy track diplomats whose job is to engage at the embassies where they are in foreign service to engage. In, and they have training programs for them. They, they train them in the art of communication, in the art of listening, and then the strategic communication. And I think um, from that perspective, it's, it's great to see the changes at, at the Hungarian Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs that they are actually taking uh, uh, steps um, to to answer the calls and to have challenges of a globalized world and 
and to recognize that cultural diplomacy play a, uh, a crucial role in, in, in advancing um, what, what is uh, the national interest of a nation. And make no mistake about the, the niceties of exchange programs and everything else. The purpose is national security and, and uh, your, uh, your national interest that you're trying to advance through these methods. Have a, I have one question to the minister. Uh, I, while you were talking, I'm so sorry, but maybe I'm mistaken, but I found some positive attitude towards the Russian Federation. And I have one question concerning this. How rational and uh, how adequate is the maintaining public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy? With a country that openly invades their leaders, finances, separatist regimes, and crush down the plane, how adequate do you think that, uh, well, you said that for each country is different, but we hope to maintain the relationship between each other. How you would imagine uh, maintaining a good relationship toward the Korean and Russian nation, or Georgian and Russian nation, and uh, how you would uh, imagine talk with Russian people because Russian government has a support that is more than 80%. So the people that you are offering have to talk, supporting the regime that does everything to so I have this question, how rational, how adequate, how educated it is or human it is to maintain all this work. But your question is concerning talking with the regime or with the country or with the, the country people? country totally because the regime is supported by the people. They have support, actual and support. I mean, have you counted it? I mean, for the. For Putin's regime, probably Putin, yes. The research says this. Putin is uh, popular that he, he never been so popular before. He has uh, support that is almost 90% and the regime has support that is more than 80%. So 80% of this is the minimum that I'm saying. 80% of Russian Federation population support the regime that does this and they, they like it. And uh, uh, they talk to all 80% of them? Sorry? Have you talked to all 80% of them? Uh, I, I, I trust uh, the research. So I, I don't want to avoid the question, sorry, because you have a legitimate right to put such a question. Um, because there is the actual event is in the Russian conflict, which is a very bitter uh, experience. And I'm so sorry for the Ukrainians and, and, and the Russians as well, because nobody gains from this you know, point of view. <clears throat> but we have to separate things. You know. uh, first of all, so that conflict always will be, unfortunately regardless of the fact that there is an effective classical diplomacy, public, whatever diplomacy, the human being is a conflict or something, I'm not an expert in that. But do we see that there is a conflict, there is another conflict there. So uh, you have to um, take it very seriously indeed, and that's why the, the international community decides what will be the conduct with the country or the regime, or whatever in the sense of this context. Uh, but how can you manage it later? How you help the development, and how you prevent things happening? Like this is very difficult. You know, because, of course, if you take all the conflicts recently happened, the Hamas in Gaza and the Israelis, the Russians and the Ukrainians, and you have an endless, the Kurds and the Islamic forces. Um, those who are in the conflict would like to seek for protection and help and support of the opposition. And there is always you know, a very large uh, scale effort to put somebody this side or that side. But if you start a conflict or if you participate in a conflict, you have to take into consideration that it never will happen, that you have full support from one side or the other side. Because there are interests. And this is also very human, that you follow sometimes your interests. It means that in, in the case of Russia or Ukraine, there are interests in Russia to start or continue this, and interest in Ukraine. You cannot count because you are not there. You are not able to reach all the information. Also, information. 
that's why you say that there is a full support for the, there is a full support for Poroshenko, President or whatever. <clears throat> but this is nothing to do with that, that the conflict should end and you should continue some kind of relation with the, with the participants of the conflict. And that's why all efforts, which seems for the first side, that this is support for one side or the other side, maybe later, it's aiming something later. Because I don't think so that, for instance, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict will continue forever. Because if uh, you know the situation, something like two, three years ago, you couldn't even think that there is a possible conflict between Ukrainians and Russians, let alone that Donetsk will be shared either by Ukrainians or by Russians, or Lugansk will be shared either Ukrainians or Russians. So that's why this conflict is there, and you have to manage the conflict, but you have to think about what is the next step, what will happen after the conflict. Yes, you can build a wall, you can dig something, you can separate forever Ukrainians, Ukrainians and Russians, but you, how do, do you separate families if you have a Ukrainian-Russian mixed marriage? You say that, <coughs> aha, do you want to repeat the bitter and terrible experience of the Yugoslavian crisis? What, what, is, what is the solution? So I, I don't think so that if you, if you don't follow a policy of total isolation, uh, which seems very proper and seems very popular from one side, is the best answer to this. Because then you cannot go get through anything, neither positive nor negative messages. Isolation is isolation, that's it. So that's why I think uh, you, you cannot put simply in diplomacy that there, there is a zero or 100% uh, uh, gain. You always have to open and keep open channels to communicate with both partners or even the worst looking partner or, or member of the conflict or participant of the conflict. So that's why uh, sometimes it's too simple to say that you have to, you have to cut all the relations, you have to cut everything, you have to, to delete this country because it's not what is really not. Next time, the next aggressor, the next situation. Even in Vietnam, the US was considered to be an aggressor by the social world. And we cut the contact, out into the security of the world, not at all. What was the outcome of the situation? That, that for instance, if you then made a poll about the perception about the US, it was still very hard, not in Vietnam, of course, because Vietnam was suffering, Napalm, Cluster bombs, I don't know how many, and the casualties on both sides. So in every conflict, if you are not a participant of the conflict, you have to be sober, you have to think about what will be the next thing, because the main goal is to end the conflict, not to increase or to uh, how to see the fuel of the conflict. Okay. So thank you for coming and thanks for our guests. Thank you.